Marsche gut. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I don't speak Swedish, unfortunately. I hope you all speak English. Yeah, I want to talk about us and about uh, us as an office and also about a few things that we worked on or that happened the last two years, <clears throat> obviously. Uh, so we're called Inside Outside, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> no, but there are Inside Out offices as well. And there's an inside-outside office, uh, also an organization that organizes correspondence between prisoners and... Uh, <laughs> so, so there's a lot of confusion sometimes. Um, we're, we're about uh, the connection, I think, between inside and outside. Uh, it, it all grew naturally uh, within my interests. That's a good idea. That's a bit nicer. William, where are you? Ah. Looks better. Thank you. Um, it grew naturally. Um, I, I was actually uh, did art uh, school and then had a lot of jobs with photographers and filmers and then uh, started to work for the Museum of Modern Art making exhibitions later on as a freelancer. So it's actually all connected and it has to do, I think, not only with literally inside and outside, but with uh, light and materials and color and change. And so for me, I think that that is the most important part of my work. And we started to be very connected to architecture, asked by architects to collaborate. Uh, and it's not a surprise why, because uh, I think we can add something to the architecture, not that it improves it necessarily, but anyway, we, uh, we add something that is temporary and very thin and very weightless often, and quite easy to manipulate. Uh, so Inside Outside is about creating screens and influencing light, uh, making kind of veils, uh, screening light and screening views or enhancing views depending on the situation for lots of public buildings. Uh, of course, uh, also making exhibitions still. And light is an essence. Uh, also in the Biennale in Venice, we opened all the windows. So in lots of exhibitions and places where art uh, regulations uh, dictate, uh, kind of lowering light um, and, and, and taking away daylight uh, for the UV, uh, of course, reasons. If we can, we always open up. Um, because I think daylight is very important and I'm, I'm sure in Sweden you know very well why. So also here in Barcelona, we opened up this gallery and created this landscape and created this uh, yeah, like coincidental uh, connection to the public who comes by, you know, also to lower uh, the threshold between culture and whatever goes on in the street. Um, it's also about really opening up, cracking open things, like this uh, parking lot who used to be under the roof and where we made a, a park. We cracked open the street or we cut open these soft walls creating kind of peepholes or uh, views in and out, unexpected effects. And whether it's in landscape or in interior, it doesn't really matter. This was a, 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 what we called a personal pavilion in Villa Manin for the Arts Biennale in Venice. And this is for Casa de Musica, where you can see it. And of course, if you talk about light, it's also about reflection. And this reflection between inside and outside through glass or through whatever materials is very important to kind of blur the, the boundary between one and the other. You don't know what is in, what is out, what is actually happening. And that to me is very interesting and also it's interesting that you create a, another dimension 
So a mirror is not only reflecting back what is there, but it also gives an extra space. And uh, as you work with materials, I'm sure you all know as architects and designers and, and landscape architects, I suppose you're all more or less connected to that field. Also as an artist, once you start working with materials all the time, you discover their characteristics and their qualities. Um, and uh, not only the, the soft materials, the plantings, the textiles, uh, etc., is interesting or is part of our work, but our work is also about movement, and not only of the material, but also really organizing movement. Uh, in landscape, of course, you understand it's, it's classic. You organize the viewer's experience of the space, but also with curtains, you organize it's uh, not only its shape, but also its movement. So it's movement through a space and the different possibilities of its, its existence, its presence. And so we see the track of a curtain uh, as you would also consider the path in a landscape. The path you can take, but you can also ignore it. And uh, the track, well, you can't really ignore it, but you can use it or not use it. And um, so this is, to us, a tool that is very comparable. And of course, paths and tracks can be straight, or they can have three-dimensional forms, or they, they just you know, start to exist because of sheer coincidence. Uh, a path can be very romantic and, and uh, uh, lyrical. But you can also imagine a path being formed three-dimensionally with trees or something like that. And of course here, as uh, we showed you in the film when we started, is a kind of the, the, the extreme uh, form of a, of a track. And the cloth that moves along it changes the architecture all the time. We're also a lot about materials, as I said, and of course the, the feel of it and what you can do with it in a different way, how you can manipulate something that is a rock and make it look like a very soft, it feels also really soft. So how do you make a rock soft or how you influence interiors with the choice of vertical and horizontal planes and how you cover them or how you create depth in something that is actually completely flat. And so that is one of our obsessions, or maybe mine, is that you also want to create space and depth where there isn't any. So the whole idea that you are enclosed into something permanent and that it stops you from going elsewhere, to me, is really uh, disturbing. So there's always this search for another depth, another layer, another escape, somehow. And our work is also a lot about structure. And um, even in textiles, of course, there is structure, whether it's in a miniature sense or, or like uh, looking through a microscope or like for Hackney Empire that we really, you know, created something enlarged uh, smocks for, for depth and effect. And uh, structure, as you all know it, uh, that it holds up something or that it co contradicts gravity. And on the contrary to weight, we are also working with weightlessness. And I think weightlessness uh, really is important, uh, has been an inspiration for me always, even if it's not literally flying, although this curtain is literally flying. Uh, the idea, you know, that everything can just go up or fall down. Uh, and you know Yves Klein, of course, he, he was a very influential uh, mind to me, uh, together with the whole zero movement in the 60s, 50s, 60s. Anyway, can you follow this far? Am I going too quick or? OK. Well, I'm going to tell a few uh, projects. It's quite a lot, so I'm going to see if I can do it a bit quick. Uh, we work in, uh, in Qatar with OMA on two different projects. And uh, one project is the National Library, where we design the landscape, but also the curtains inside. And of course, we are always advisors on interior finishes. 
And uh, the garden around the library is actually a, a series of indentations uh, to hold whatever rain is there, which is only a few millimeters a year. Um, and uh, in these indentations, we organized two families, a families of agave and a family of acacias. And uh, to make these indentations, there were lots of tests made, but also one-to-one -one tests, as we call it, um, uh, and so that we could comment how we thought it should be built and how what the detailing should look like. Um, and then the idea is that in these indentations, these plants are planted, of course, uh, and there's a whole drainage system and a system that holds the water uh, when there is some. And the idea here is that it uh, is maintenance-free after two or three years so that no water is given. And the exciting thing of the last uh, two years is that it's really being built. And I'm sure you know this feeling, but it's extremely exciting. So it's really happening, as it were. This is going to be a, a fountain at the entrance. And uh, in Qatar, lots of people work from all over the world. And we are happy to create an environment where people like to sleep around. There's also another kind of garden, uh, a kind of patio garden. And so the excitement of seeing it really coming, you know, becoming something physically there from, from the first sketch and model to reality is, of course, uh, new to us in the sense that we've worked, I think the, the uh, prison garden I designed in 97 uh, was realized and also the museum park with Yves Brunier. But a lot of gardens, and a lot of projects take so many years that uh, not everything is also realized. Uh, in the same library, you also as a designer follow the building site and you see the black line, uh, it is a, a, a steel beam that ha is hovering over a, an auditorium in the middle of this huge open space, well, future open space. Um, and here you see the auditorium uh, being built and that frame is going to hold a, a curtain track and on that curtain track, a, a curtain will hang. And I think I was involved in the design and, and the, the whole interior kind of composition uh, years and years ago. And, uh, and so I also imagined this steel beam that would follow the, uh, the slope of the seats of the auditorium. It seemed to me much nicer than to have a curtain as a kind of bucket. You know, a curtain that would do this to me at that time seemed much more interesting. Uh, four years later, we got the commission to make the curtain. And then I really scolded myself and said, what the have I done? Because it's really difficult to create a curtain that hangs diagonally. And why? Because a curtain that hangs diagonally, the cloth doesn't hang really beautifully. Um, and also you have to store a curtain. So if you don't like a curtain to be like a nuisance uh, pieces of cloth in, in a space, you need to wrap it somewhere so it creates another beautiful object or convincing object or architectural object. Um, and so if you have a sloping situation, a curtain uh, can hang, of course, creating this auditorium, creating the room. But then if you want to open it, this piece is longer, this is shorter or the other way around. So you have to shift this whole thing, in this case, upward. And that means that here it hangs in a slope and here it hangs straight, and here it hangs straight. And it's the same cloth that needs to do that. So we realized that we uh, had to think of a, of a kind of cloth that would not do as usual cloths do. And one uh, um, possibility was, we thought, to create a, a, quite a normal cloth, but to create in-between zones that would fold open and close into in the corners where you shift it and then you could work with a kind of uh, harmon harmonium um, system or accordion system but soon we discovered that that didn't work and then we thought we have to create our own cloth 
in which the weave is actually so slippery that it would slip in itself. And so that the, the, the yarn uh, is, is actually changing position through the, the way it is hung. And together with the Textile Museum in Tilburg, we, uh, we de developed this kind of cloth. And of course, also a design. And uh, the design is in this case not so important, but it is referring to the sky and, and to nighttime in the desert. And we had some decorations, uh, um, of course, added that had to do with the culture and the measurement of the stars, etc. And then, uh, of course, it's not only the cloth, but it's also the way you organize the, the different pieces of, uh, of the curtain. You have to create openings for emergency exits. Uh, you have to see to it that there is no light uh, uh, um, leak, at least as least as possible, and that there is a good sound uh, absorption system. And you collaborate, of course, with uh, track engineers, with motors, etc. And then you start to understand what this cloth, this curtain should have as a shape. So in the end, this is the shape of the entire curtain. And as you understand, the curtain always has a front and a back side, like in any uh, architectural plane. Uh, and what our ambition is always a bit larger than only the simple ambition. Our ambition was to create two sides that were completely different, but in one cloth. So in a damast, or we, we say um, jacquard technique, you can weave in a way that you, you have, of course, connection between front and back, but not completely. So you can, you can have a kind of mysterious two faces. Uh, the design is, of course, in different layers. There are stars, as we call it. There are uh, stripes because the cloth, if you make a cloth that is very slippery, it needs structure. And so, uh, of course, if you make something loose in architecture, you have the same. So this structure was every so many, I think, 24 centimeters, there's a kind of rib of cloth that is woven more dense, and then it's loose again, then it's dense again, it's loose again, dense again. And uh, that had to be, of course, vertical. Otherwise, you don't have this movement. So the whole design was uh, uh, influenced by the ribs and, of course, the image, and then later the color. Um, and then if you have a weaving machine, you don't have a choice how you weave. So it turned out that to make these stripes vertical in reality, we had to sew all the bands of cloth together in a horizontal manner. And then you have computer systems that uh, you have to translate as a designer your design into miniature. So every, every weaving stitch is a millimeter or even less. So you have to draw all these things. The diagonal that you see in the cloth design is to help the shift. So the diagonal goes exactly there where the shift, one side this way, the other side this way. And so it's an it's a incredible work to get it all uh, understood. Not only uh, uh, the, the, the weave, but also what is front and what is back and what your possibilities are in change. And then finally you get a piece of cloth. And then there's a whole uh, uh, process I won't tell you about finding the right yarn and finding the right color, uh, the ingredients for the color, how it attaches to the yarn, etc. And then it has to be flame retardant, so there is a treatment after you weave it of flame retardant uh, moisture. And you have to think about how you connect these bands or widths of cloth together later on with a very slippery material that actually wants to fall apart. So to say that we have simple ambitions is unfortunately not possible. <laughs> I can understand you're laughing. Um, so here is how, because on top of, of all these layers, we also had the ambition to change the color. 
So we wanted the outside to be all white and silver, but the inside to change from black to dark blue to lighter blue to blue, and then back again to black. So that is also in your weaving program in the computer, you have to tell what yarn has to mix with what yarn, etc. And then you get a piece of cloth in your studio and you start to study what is going, what it's becoming, and looks promising. I think there is one and a half year between the, the first, or maybe two, between the first ideas and what is now in front of you in this picture. Uh, and here you see that the, the widths are produced, but then they are now treated with this fire resisting, uh, uh, you know, fire retardancy moisture. And of course, what does cloth, especially when it's woven loosely, it starts to go in all directions. So uh, the Textile Museum uh, made these frames, like a painter's frame, where each cloth is, uh, is stretched while it dries. And then when that is done, it's rolled up, and then it goes to Germany, to the production company, because the production company needs to take these cloths and, and widths and, and sew them or whatever together. And we make all these uh, uh, detailed sketches of how the edges and the entrances and the corners and the connections need to become. And in the meantime, of course, the, the, the building, the library, is getting more and more recognizable. So if you then take a test to Doha and you hang it, you can see all of a sudden the connections between the architecture uh, and the, the idea of this cloth. And you can also critically look at details like you see this, this connection between two widths and how that can be improved, etc. And then it's being done. And then is the moment that you realize, what the hell you've been designing? It's a huge drawing, but it's also a huge building. And you see some little mistakes here and there, but nobody will probably notice. So that is going to be hung, hopefully in spring of next year, we hope. Then in Qatar we have another project, not far, also in Education City, also with OMA. Of course, the, it's a desert environment, everyone will know about that. And um, the Sheikh Moza at that time was head of the Qatar Foundation, and um, OMA was designing, or has designed, uh, the Qatar Foundation headquarters and another building nearby. And um, I think Qatar at that moment and still is really talking about globalization, as everyone does, but also about uh, this whole issue of national pride. And national pride is in Europe now big because of all the, uh, the fugitives and immigrants. Uh, but even there, it is also not for that reason, but everyone has a bit uh, a kind of fright, I think, of losing their identity. Uh, and so national pride becomes very important. So we thought as landscape architects in this case uh, to really enhance the beauty of the desert's uh, plants. And uh, we went to the universities, we talked to people, to biologists and to botanists and Professor Batanuni, who unfortunately uh, died a few years later, to learn from them about, of course, we went into the desert, but you can't go into the desert. You, you only see little parts. But we learned from them that there are, in fact, in the desert of Qatar, 15 different plant communities. Um, there, sometimes there, there are lots of the same plants, but they are different compositions of, of groups, of families, or, or yeah, communities. Uh, and that depends on wind and on height and on, on, on salt because, of course, there's a, a, a lots of desalination going on in these countries to, to have drinking water. So, and they throw, apparently, throw the sea, um, salt back in the sea. So this saltiness 
enters the desert. And um, yeah, some plants can have it and others not. Uh, in any case, 15 different kinds of communities. And so we selected uh, communities and were uh, planning to use those. And um, our landscape was actually not as in the library in full soil, but on the roof of a parking lot. So in fact, we had a very synthetic situation. And so I imagined that we would make a, a, a grid or system of planters, uh, but also a system of watering, so that we would have high planters to low planters and a water system from more to, to none at all. Because, of course, you are limited in what uh, the amount of water you use in this kind of climates. So this is what we did. We made this grid of planters. Usually I hate planters, but in this case, there was no choice. And we chose to finish, like the interior, uh, at the entrance at least, the whole plate, uh, this, this floating plate with travertin. And so the planters and the ground and the street for the en towards the entrance were all made of the same stone, or clad with the same stone, I should say. And so the planters are filled with these communities, um, and the communities start full community on the right on, on your right hand side, and the selection of these groups becomes less and less. So on the left hand side, you have maybe only one or two of the same community. Then we have street trees, as we call it, trees that are like confettied all over the place, and we have trees that grow out of the parking up because, of course, we work with engineers and with OMA architects, uh, and, and the parking needs air, and it needs draft, and it needs income and outcoming uh, air, etc. So our whole, uh, let's say, innocent pl plan became completely um, functional in the sense of integrating everything in these planters, and sometimes creating openings uh, for air in the literal openings for air in the parking, but also for stairs, for emergency exits, etc. And so this is the kind of planting plans that we made. Each blob is a, is a type, and then sometimes there is a, what we call a exotic, exotic planters uh, that give this whole garden a certain energy, because of course desert plants, grasses and shrubs, tend to go to sleep, and so there are exotics that keep this whole thing um, very colorful and sculptural. And so this whole process, uh, you can see, has different phases, but then all of a sudden it's being built. And all the details that you draw are put into practice. And from the building, looking out. And meanwhile, we're, uh, of course, defining more and more in detail the planting, but also uh, having all the numbers of planting and collaborating with other uh, landscape architects who work in the same city um, to coordinate the, the nurseries and the, the, you know, you have to you, you have to grow these plants because they are not normal. So you have to collect seeds and, and, and organize a whole thing. And you have to find nurseries who really sign contracts to do it for you. Or not for us, but for, of course, this institution. And then... Uh, starts to happen. That is the beginning. Now we hope that it will grow beautifully in the coming hundred years and be used as a kind of laboratory, hopefully also for uh, universities, etc. In any case, we have a lot of birds' nests already, so that's a very good sign. Any questions? I never know what that means. Uh, we've been asked to do an intervention in uh, an existing house. It's called Haus Sonnefeld in Rotterdam. Um, it's, it's a house built in 1933. Um, 
by Brinkman and van der Vlucht architects, they were part of the architecture of the Nieuwe Bouwen. Um, they also built the Van Nelle Fabriek, I don't know if you know it, um, and the director of the Van Nelle Fabriek um, uh, asked the same architects to build his private villa. And uh, in the 30s, uh, the whole uh, tendency in Holland was about uh, light, air and space, Lucht, Licht and Ruimte, yeah. Air, light and space, uh, uh, as opposed to the whole 20s architecture with lots of brick and little openings, also beautiful. They were uh, more about functionality and hygiene and so lots of windows and and lots of air coming in and so on. But also uh, the owner had been to America and was very much charmed by American uh, technical things. So he has, the whole house has built in clocks and, 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 and uh, kitchen machines that were all completely new. And this house is, belongs to the Architecture Institute uh, of the Netherlands and uh, has become a, what you call a house museum. Um, and so you can visit the house, and the house is furnished, and it looks as if these people are still living there. Uh, and yeah, somehow people find, and I, me too, I must say, find it attractive to, to, to see this entirety of a garden and a house and all the furniture. And sometimes, uh, yeah, you also wonder, I wonder, what it actually is, and, and why it is interesting, and why it's still being done. Anyway, the new director of the new institution, the Architecture Institute has become the new institute, asked uh, me to do an intervention in this house for six months. And as I make curtains, or we, our team, and as we do uh, landscapes uh, or garden design, he said, well, you know, you can make your own curtains, or you can change all the carpets, or you can even change the garden, whatever you like. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to show my work in this house. I think the house is really beautiful. So what I would like to do is kind of accentuate um, the architecture or the essence of the meaning of the architecture. So we made a presentation, and that looked like this, that if we take away all the voile, all the vitrage, so the filter between inside and outside, and if we put mirror on the floor, then you get a kind of, yeah, a kind of exaggeration of the whole idea of Licht, Lucht and Ruimte. And I wanted to do the same outside. And so it was accepted as an idea, and we wanted these uh, mirror plates to not be too permanent, so we decided to make it of a soft material and uh, of course made all the drawings and worked with a very good carpenter and did a very precise job everywhere, these plates. And then the house became like this. And these plates also go out in, onto the terrace and the balconies. And so you don't know, it's like water, you don't know where the beginning and end is. And what it also is, is, is actually a comment on this house museum, because you see the underside of everything. So all of a sudden, you discover that there is, you know, every single object has an alarm system. You see cables, you see batteries, you see everything. But it's also voyeurism, because you look under the bed, you know, and you look under everything. So it, it made loose a lot of comments and a lot of discussions about what is actually a house museum and what is real and what is fake, etc. And what of course also happens is these weird things that change the architecture. And this was very beautiful in the beginning and also quite uh, the house completely deformed as if we are in Barcelona looking at uh, you know who and then six months later it's of course a different season and the things become to you know not perfect anymore and I, I thought that was quite interesting so I made these pictures last week 
Here you see, for instance, you, you think it's an innocent table with some berlach, by the way, pressed glass, beautiful. And then you look into the mirror and you see it's a steel table. It's like a building that you can expand uh, uh, to any size. You see the underside of the edges of all the cupboards that's not painted. And everything becomes... And what, what I really liked also is, is, is the curtains that fall are all of a sudden our structure standing up straight. And you look into the pleats that you never see usually. And the trees grow down into the crust of the earth. Right. Uh, we're also working in Taipei for Performing Arts Center. This is how we start, how I start, because I've been there and I've looked at everything, but also at OMA's models, this one. The whole idea is that it's one fly tower with three different auditoriums sticking into the fly tower, and so that the auditoriums use all use the same tech technical stuff, and they can also be connected together. But there's also a big plaza around it, and that plaza has to be used for markets and night uh, uh, food markets at night, etc. So we created a very graphic plaza that uh, attracts the people to the entrance, because the whole theater is lifted, so you can walk underneath and find the stairs. And we also looked with the architects at the whole uh, movement through the interior and about colors, finishes, graphics, changing the whole idea of a space through exaggeration of color and finishes. And we're looking at the curtains that need to come. We're still working and, and, and starting possibly soon and the landscape that was envisioned here by us with the markets and of course on each roof there are terraces and the whole idea here is that we have two stages and that the trees on those stages are actors so they each have their very very specific character so we're choosing very specific trees that are very uh, different from one another and then it becomes an official presentation, and it's being built right now. Bye. Is this a very boring story? No. Okay. I hope not. So this is what we're... Uh, so we're following uh, it being built, and we go now and then, but we're also digitally in communication now with the people who help us choose the trees. And it's sometimes really hilarious, because Look at this. So, do you know if this tree is okay or not? And which tree are they absolutely looking at? I guess it's the tree with the two blue belts, right? But I don't see it. Well, see four meters and then nothing, but I have to say yes or no. Yes, no, yes, maybe. Uh, where are we now? Oh yes, we're in Saudi Arabia with uh, Snuheta. Snuheta made a cultural center and educational center somewhere in Saudi Arabia. I, I haven't been there yet, so it doesn't really mean so much to me yet. And it's a very interesting uh, process because uh, I went to visit Snuheta, the office, and they said, very nice to meet you, Ms. Blaise, but actually we're not involved you are supposed to follow the hierarchy of this uh, uh, specific uh, project because it's the client is um, Aramco and they hired uh, an office in Australia to coordinate the art implementations and you are an art impl implementation. Okay. Okay, so we work through Australia to Saudi Arabia where we've not been. Okay, fine. So can you send us material so we understand where we have to make this auditorium curtain? And so we were sent... Hey, yeah. 
Yeah, inside, outside. There you go. And this is it. You know. And this is the cut. And that's the fly tower. And well, anyway, that's where it has to go. And this is approximately our interior. And we said, okay. Hmm. Well, we guess that these are balconies and that these balconies are kind of folded. So, email. What is the concept of this auditorium? Yes, folded uh, stone, you know. Uh, crystals, crystals. Okay, so we started to develop a concept. And uh, the concept that was chosen was, of course, something that enhances uh, the architectural intent, that is to continue the crystal-like folds in the curtain. And of course, this is only possible because it's a, it's a guillotine curtain. We asked before, do you use it like this or like that? No, it's one that comes down from the fly tower and then goes up again. And so you can make something quite three-dimensional, literally three-dimensional. And uh, so we were thinking how, so they liked that, Aramco, through Australia, let us know that they liked that and that the architects had seen it and also liked it. And then we thought, well, how shall we make this structure? And we found two systems. One I called the Castiglioni system, which you probably all know this, this lamp. Uh, it's stretched because of a weight. And because of the weight, this tube stays where it is, but if you lift the weight, whoop, the tube falls down. That idea seemed interesting to me. The other idea is, is what is called the tensegrity, which you probably all know. It's a push and pull system. And uh, so we tested both and we invited Arab engineers to join us. Uh, they have an office, really, we can bike there in half an hour, so it's great. And they were very excited by our amateur way of thinking something could be done. And they said, we'll help you and we'll see what Castiglioni or Tensegrity, what would be the most uh, plausible. Then after studying that, we chose for Tensegrity. And at Inside Outside, we made a small model. Okay, so how, how would that work? And where is then the curtain? Huh? So the curtain is then central and that uh, structure goes both ways. So we had to call with all the technicians in Saudi Arabia, who all turned out to be Australian, uh, and ask them, how much space do we have in this fly tower? You know, how much thickness can we make? Well, we could make 40 centimeters. Okay, 40 centimeters, that's not so much, so we need to, f to use the whole depth so we probably will have to put cloth in front and behind the structure. So you, you use the whole depth. So we make this, this is how we work. We make these paper things. Ah, oh, that's my earring you hear all the time. Wait. Well, is it, it's nice, no? It's like a drum. Anyway, a woman without earrings. Pfft. Forget it. Okay, so this whole system is then worked out a bit by us, and then we connect to that structure different possible designs. Uh, you must imagine that flat rectangle is the curtain. Uh, and so we proposed a few things to uh, Saudi Arabia, to Aramco and the Australian firm and the architects, kind of variations on everything. And then they chose this one, because they thought it looked very festive. And we, of course, agree. And then uh, we have to know how, of course, you have an opening of the stage, but you know how it works with theater. It opens and closes, it goes wider and... Uh -huh. So how does this uh, thing, this object, fit in it? And how can you influence either their way of working or our uh, composition. And this is uh, then uh, very exciting, Arab uh, calculating everything. 
and uh, telling us exactly, and we talk with them, can you make it as thin as possible? Can you make it as light as possible? Can you make it this and that and this and that? And they always say yes, which is really great. So, um, for instance, the cables that you see, do you see them or is it very light? Ah, you don't see them. Oh well, uh, what shall I say? Each, each little tube there is actually pushing out a cable and holding back a cable and they all go to the corners of the steel creating this, uh, it's really a bad quality, but here you see it a bit better, right? Or not? These lines are cables. So you imagine you have to cover it with cloth or go cloth behind. The cloth, of course, needs to reach this corner and that corner. Um, so it was quite a lot of work before uh, we found, Arab found this solution that the cables actually go thanks to this knob in the middle, actually go to the center of where folds come together. Uh, and that is really a big... Do you see this one? Yeah, you see it. Good. So that uh, means that we can make a very uh, neat uh, uh, fold. Then you have to, of course, uh, think about transportation and uh, storage and uh, bending moments, containers, if it can enter the, the, the building, and how you get these things together. Of course, if, if, if a form has many directions, you can't just put it like this. So you need to find a way to connect them. And then we work with Octatube, which uh, company completely um, specialized in structures to hold glass uh, uh, facades, and they are helping us making the structure. And it will be hung next year. No, it will be hung, yeah, February or March, because then the king is coming and it has to be ready. We won a competition in Amsterdam, which to us was a huge uh, uh, luxury that we could just bike there and take measurements and speak to the university people. Uh, we won uh, a competition for the um, outside spaces of this university campus uh, in the center of Amsterdam, uh, actually as a prolongation of all the canal systems. Um, and it was great to do that. And we. Um, imagined a, a ribbon connecting all these faculties and a ribbon leading people, not literally, but showing in entrances and exits uh, to treat all, of course we have to design all the sidewalks and the streets and everything, the whole traffic system, parkings, bike parkings, uh, water drainage, uh, etc., the usual. And there are a lot of K's, there's a lot of water in Amsterdam, as you know, so it's about uh, the street materials and about green, green roofs, uh, plantings, uh, patio gardens, street gardens, etc. And of course it's used by thousands and thousands of students who all are smoking outside and who throw their bike anywhere. So we need to organize it in such a way that they start to become a bit aware of their environment. So uh, we call this the crazy courtyard, I think, but it's been planted and made. And basically, we use the same bricks as the canals of Amsterdam, uh, but we fill it with a, a ribbon of white stripes, and these white stripes are white, through and through white bricks, and they uh, uh, kind of animate uh, the whole streetscape. And you don't need to follow them, but they lead you to everything that is important. So that has been, is in the making. So this is not only about flowers and beauty, but also in a way about precision uh, and going there and saying, okay, instead of um, making it chaotic, maybe you can you know, make this white line hit this uh, 
reinforcement instead of stopping earlier and filling it with brown bricks. And so all these details are, are important to follow as a landscape, I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because the red brick comes in these crates, right? And then they do all the details later. And we also, I don't know if you saw it, we also designed benches. Oh, yeah. So this bench, for instance, we designed, it all has to be very strong, huh? so it's not very elegant, but we tried. So we made all the benches in the same form as this white ribbon, and they float above it. So it's it's wooden planks that that go from small to larger to small, and sometimes there's a little back support, and, and that's it. And we also um, uh, said they should do for the uh, cigarettes these. Uh, I don't know if you have them here in Sweden. They are in the ground. You have a ashtray, ashtray in the ground instead of all these ugly ashtrays, but. I'm not sure they, they recognize them. I think uh, we have to design a board saying, you know, like Roy Lichtenstein, like a, this, this cigarette bud. And maybe they, then they will. I don't smoke, obviously, so I'm not. Yeah, there was a time, I, I, something went away here. This is um, something we worked on, we, we started working on, with, again, with the textile museum. Uh, they came to, uh, so Textile Museum is not a museum actually, it's a textile institution and uh, it has the most fantastic weaving uh, machines, old and new, and knitting machines and tufting machines and they are in a museum in the sense that it's open to the public and all their craftsmen, they are getting older, but all their craftsmen are unbelievably uh, trained and they teach people or they show people how these weaving machines work. And they are open to artists and designers to, to weave things with them, but it cannot be commercial. Uh, so that's why this whole thing in Qatar is woven with them. And we made also a curtain for the Berlin um, Dutch Embassy with them. And now they came to us and said, we want you to work with us on something technical. Excuse me, technical. So uh, some, something that is called tech textile. Uh, are you interested? Uh, you ha we have six months and we have very little money, but are you interested? And I said, yes. We said, well, should, can we choose something? And they said, yes. And we said, can we then study the curtain as a form to collect sun energy? Because it's too stupid that we are doing all these things on huge facades in climates that have a lot of sun and that we don't do anything with it. So they thought that was a good idea. So they connected us to a young man who specialized in um, sun energy. Uh, and then I said to them, you know, we have a story with this because, and this is a very old project, we did a competition, an open competition coming from America. And the question was, and this was in 2002, the question was, can you make a mobile clinic for the sub-Saharan countries to, uh, to fight the HIV? And, uh, and we thought, well, we're not architects, but let's try. We have nothing to lose. And we thought we would make a textile and that textile would have zippers on three sides. A three, it's a triangular textile. And now you can see it a bit here. And we will make sun collecting uh, fishes, or how do you call it, these little sun collecting uh, cells. We will sew them on the textile and connect them, of course, with, uh, with steel or aluminum or copper. And then uh, on the back side, we will make uh, animation of how to, uh, to prevent being infected. And we will sew pockets with condoms. And then you have a piece of cloth with information and condoms on one side, sun collecting cells on the other side. And with the sun collecting cells, you can, you know, cook water or 
start a little refrigerator to store your medicines. And because of the zippers, the more you have, the bigger things you can make, so it could become a tent. But because it's light and soft, you can transport it through the desert on the bicycle or walking. So it's all really easy. Um, and this, this whole symbol is, of course, that the HIV virus and this piece of cloth spread in the same manner. So it's very, you don't need any trucks or anything. Well, we, if we sent it and we never heard of it. Nothing. And then we saw that somebody, one who made a container. Container, come on. Anyway, so this is the idea that you have so many opportunities to do something. And in fashion, uh, we know that people are already, designers are already using it which is great, you know, it's either giving warmth or energy to, to give a battery for your phone, etc. So we started with a team there and machines, discovered that we, uh, knitting was better than weaving, because what did we have to do? We had to, of course, make a, a curtain that could integrate these solar cells. And the guy who worked with, who was connected to us, uh, said there are really beautiful cells that we imagined in 2002 that are really thin. They are, you know, like plastic little things, but they were much too expensive, so we couldn't use them. So we got these hard things. Um, and so we had to make real pockets for these things to be integrated. And we took two imagined uh, cases. One is the textile museum itself in the Netherlands with not so much sun, well, you know what I mean. And one is the library in Doha. Uh, and uh, uh, the calculation was how is the position of these cells towards the sun in these two different climates. And then you have to create a textile and a system that these cells indeed have this possibility. Um, so we created a, a kind of... Uh, a little uh, talut where this cell was made on in the right uh, corner. And there were all these calculations, of course, what cells can do. And we made lots of drawings, what it should become, and did all these uh, knitting tests, how you can make pockets or fins, pockets preferably. You get all the collection of tryouts. Then, of course, you have to talk about aesthetics. If you hang this in front of a window, it needs to be transparent, it needs to have a nice color, it needs to be outside, it needs to handle the heat and the sun and the rain, what kind of yarn do you find, etc. So everything parallel, like an oil patch of, of different things that need to be researched and had to come together. And then, of course, the copper yarn that is in the market Thin, but not really thin. So we also tried aluminum yarn because that was much thinner, or uh, stainless steel yarn, I mean, and tried out in the knitting machine what it could handle. Now we heard that copper is a better transporter of energy than uh, aluminum and stainless steel. So we tried that, but we broke, really nearly broke the whole knitting machine, unfortunately. But on the whole market, we couldn't find thinner copper yarn or copper thread. So that's something. Actually, what we discovered is that you all find out what doesn't exist yet or the, what is not important enough, obviously, to develop for the industry. So this is what we finally approximately uh, came up with. And then, of course, you want a big element, as big as this room at least, uh, to have variation and, and some form of decorative uh, quality. And the transparency. And all these black rectangles are obviously the cells. And then all the calculations and drawings, how these plus and minus, who can never touch each other, how they are organized in the textile, in the cloth, and how the folds are organized, so that the folds, of course, that they don't touch, 
while you, because the whole thing needs to be, of course, folded as well. If the window has to be cleaned or, you know. So, uh, nearly a year it became, but uh, then some measurements were made how much uh, we could get from a square meter of this kind of system. Well, this was not really something to be proud of because that is quite easy apparently. But this was interesting. If we would measure the whole surface of these two quasi cases, uh, we could have the weaving machine or the knitting machine in the textile museum a whole year. You know, if you just have it the whole year there, the whole year the knitting machine can function. And in Qatar, of course, much more you can do the whole air conditioning system. So that's exciting, we think. And now is the moment that, of course, it stops and that we need to go a step further a certain day and find sponsors and industry that needs to get interested. Or I called the MIT University in America they were very interested, but the first question is, and who's the sponsor? And where's the money? And I said, there is no money. We just do it. But that's, of course, totally naive. So that's the next step. In the meantime, and Carlotta knows all about it, uh, we also work on a park, public park in Milan, which uh, we won with a very nice team in 2004. So the competition started in 2002, I think, or maybe 2003, with Mirko Zardini, an urban uh, theorist, uh, uh, um, urban planner, with um, uh, Michael Maltzen, architect from Los Angeles, uh, inside outside as a landscape architect, um, Irma Bohm as a graphic designer, and Pete Audolf as a planting designer, uh, and of course a landscape engineer from the Netherlands. And we thought, well, we have such competition, you know, Martha Schwartz and Peter Walker and Adrian Reuse, and forget it, we'll never win it. So at least let's have fun. And uh, the idea of the competition was to connect with this, uh, there's, a, there's a station on one side, there's the Stazione Centrale not far away, Stazione Garibaldi on that side, and this whole space in between is a kind of uh, empty space uh, since the Second World War, and they wanted to make a public park that would connect all the areas, so different cultures, different, you know, business to residential to cultural, etc., and also be a kind of uh, a welcoming garden for all the new developments around this space by Heinz developers and others. And, of course, it's not flat, and we wanted to create a park that would be attractive also from all perspectives and from the buildings. And what we did was indeed literally connect everything with a, a web of paths, and these were written with information uh, about the planting. And uh, the fields that were created by these paths were all different, so we wanted to really create a botanic garden in a kind of modern way, and as a confetti on this park, circular forests, each made of one specific tree that would be like rooms, inhabitable rooms, each different, sometimes empty and sometimes filled. And of course, these uh, uh, tree rooms uh, being kind of equal to architectural volumes and therefore connecting the whole thing. And we didn't hear anything since 2004, February, when we heard that we had won the competition, which was unbelievable. We couldn't believe it, but it's a big honor. And didn't hear for six years, and then I called them and said, uh, the municipality is the client, and said, listen, I read, I just reread the competition uh, document, um, and it says that if you don't give us a contract within six months, you owe us 78,000 euro. And it's now 2009. So, can you please uh, uh, go to your bank and pay us 78,000 euro? Because we can use it, you know? And then they woke up and said, no way, we're not going to give you 78,000 euro. Don't you want the job? Of course we said, yes, we want the job. So, we went to Milan 
had a big discussion and got our first contract. And the first contract says, please analyze the current situation of the site that you won this competition for. And that was not a really big feast, uh, but very interesting. Uh, I'm sure you know, and we found so many Pozzetti uh, Carlotta that I think you spent half, one and a half year to analyze what they are for and what the hell we should do with them. And we opened a few and were there with our team. We found local landscape architect Franco Giorgetta and his daughter's uh, office. And we uh, sampled, tried to get all the drawings from all the different parties underground metros, bus stations, underground train tracks, God knows what, uh, the plans for uh, emergency exits for the metro, uh, who's owning what, and it was incredibly complex. And then we made a model to see how we could make a park over all this underground world, uh, and started to draw and say, convince the parties, which is the developers and the municipality, that it really could be done still according to the original design. And that to us was really to be proud of, because we were, we had designed, of course, with the consciousness that everything changes all the time, and that politics in Italy and Milan would change all the time, and therefore, like in any country, but therefore, you know, it would be a push and pull. So, in fact, it was a very simple uh, recipe for this park. It looks terrible on this screen. It looks quite nice here, but... Um, yeah, lots of talking, huh? And dealing. And then we got another contract for the definitive design, which we did together with the team, of course, measuring everything and convincing the, especially the developers who were building all around it. I wish you could uh, see this. Maybe I should turn it around. But anyway, it's all about the principle that, you know, it's usable space and flexible space. So, of course, we had to adjust the concept, simplify it, make it more usable for public, uh, less maintenance. But we were really our ambition was that you could really use it for everything. And then uh, we delivered all our uh, drawings, enormous sheets, enormous heaps of uh, each uh, separate thing, and then the whole process of approval came, because it goes through all the, the municipality and everyone needs to, and some didn't have time, so it took six months or three months, which was great. But so we put all these remarks all the time on this map, on this plan, because then we could understand what the repercussions were of all the different comments and adjusted it accordingly as much uh, as well as we could, which is all interesting. Huh? It's not, uh, uh, I'm not saying that it's a terrible work, it's really interesting, but it's sometimes it's a bit stretched. Um, so they're starting to build parts, and then all of a sudden you go and you see this, and you think, wow, it's really going to happen. Then they take away the polluted soil. We had a, a budget of 20 million, and 10 million went to taking away the polluted soil. And then it's going to be delayed one year because of the World Expo. And they wanted a field with, uh, with wheat, which is a very good idea, so that it was in the theme of the Expo. And that will take till next year. And then we just signed the contract for Executivo. Did I tell you? And this, this is because I, I was there, we had such an argument because we were shifted from the municipality to the developer. They are now our client in this Executivo. And they had such a terrible contract that I went there and I went like this. <laughs> which I usually don't do. But it helped. Because four hours later we had a signed contract. And this is our contract. Yeah, good, huh? Great. 
Uh, in the meantime, we are working in Berlin for an Israeli developer. And uh, here we are developing into a new direction again. Um, they, he asked us first to develop an, a concept for the gardens of this uh, new, new place. He bought a very old uh, a hospital in this area. You see this, this brick, huge building. And he asked architects, local architects, to, to make uh, other buildings around it. And the central building has an enormous attic. And after getting to know each other by drawing gardens and, and discussing interiors, he asked us to design this central attic and to change it into a very attractive house. And it's a really beautiful attic, very dark. Uh, nothing has been done there by this hospital. It wasn't a storage, it wasn't used for anything. Uh, and so it's a very thin roof with beautiful uh, ceramic tiles. And we started to fantasize what, what we could implement in it to make something exciting, something unexpected. I had all kinds of fantasies, of course with things sticking out and blobs and stuff. Uh, and then thought, well, maybe it's more realistic to start to think architecturally uh, instead of blobby and softy. Um, and so we started to think about a villa inside this attic, but really like a modern villa. And what we also discovered is that it would be interesting to leave the attic as it is, so not try to modernize it, but especially, uh, you know, use all the tools to make it fireproof. Well, up to a certain point we will, but not too much, but uh, uh, not uh, climatize it, but to make the house inside climatized. And so that the attic in itself actually becomes more like an outside space. And we did some scale uh, studies and discovered really interesting things. So this is Philip Johnson's villa inside the attic. This is Villa Rotonda by Palladio inside the attic. This is Moria House <laughs> by Nishizawa inside the attic. And uh, yeah, the owner liked uh, Philip Johnson idea and us too. So now the whole idea is that, you know, you have this glass, totally futuristic, different thing, like a sort of James Bond film, inside this huge, actually a forest of wooden columns. Uh, and I said to them, listen, it's really easy. We just have to cut all the wooden columns and put a glass box inside. Pfft, what's, what's so difficult about that? Uh, and then we, we get, got a lot of uh, reactions from the engineers who work on this building. And we also uh, realized, of course, it's not that naive. But I was imagining Lina Bobardi's museum in Sao Paulo, that you do steel beams that hold all the... There, were, there are 67 uh, wooden c columns holding the roof, you know. It doesn't do anything else, it holds the roof but they, they, they are standing in the way. So if you make steel beams, then you could, you know, cut them and have a very open glass house in, its, in the middle. And of course, we are now working with Arab engineers and in Berlin to calculate everything and to see how we can open the roof for daylight. And we are studying all kinds of glass types and other types of things and study and compare uh, pricing with uh, performance, etc. And we're preparing all this for the commission that needs to say if we can do it or not. And they are very positive, so it can uh, maybe happen. So this, this the whole concept of these gardens around this glass house. And then uh, we had a first talk with this commission of Berlin and we showed these huge windows like an atelier sticking out and they said, uh, no, that's not possible. It should be more like this. So yes, well, okay, then we make one floor instead of two and the owner also really prefers to make one floor instead of two, which is also nice. It's still 145 square meters. 
It's nine by 15 and a half by three meters 20 high. And of course, it has to have an enormous contrast. And this part will also be closed and will become the bedroom. Yes, yes. So uh, what is good about one floor is if you make one floor, you don't need to make everything completely fireproof. You have to treat it, but you don't have to build uh, enormous, uh, you know, uh, socks around them, or how do you call it? Huh? And uh, so one floor uh, is better than two floors, because if you have to close, you have to do that. And then you lose this whole wooden romantic idea. So in this uh, uh, concept, we keep it like it is and take away only what is necessary. Uh, and so it needs to be weightless and ethereal, but the structure that is needed to do it <laughs> is actually the red part. So it'll be invisible, but it will be hidden inside this partly in the ceiling, partly in the floor, and partly in a, in a wall that has to be inside. And this is the detailing we are working now. Thank you.